Welcome to Life Church Panania Online. Thank you for joining us. We're your hosts. I'm Ian. And I'm Eleanor. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for choosing to do church with us today. The theme that we're going to follow as we go through today's service is Follow Jesus Footprints. And the reason why we've chosen that title is because our text has these words. Christ left you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. So let's pray before we begin. Gracious Father, our desire is that we would indeed follow Jesus. Give us the grace to follow closely, follow everywhere, follow every step along our way, follow every moment of every day so that we don't get sidetracked, we don't get lost, but we pursue this pathway all the way home. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to follow that theme as we sing our first song. You're online. You're allowed to sing. I'm going to follow you, Jesus.
Indeed, that's what we want, to keep on following him. Now, what's news for our church family? First of all, if you like our church, tell the world, look, everybody in the world tells what they like. How about you like and share the great church we have here? Congratulations, some milestone anniversaries for a couple of our church couples. George and Aileen celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary and John and Joy celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. Congratulations! Eleanor and I have just celebrated our 16th wedding anniversary, so we've got quite a way to go. Speaking of going, here are the physical Christmas child boxes that we collected in a physical church and they were physically taken off a couple of days ago ready to be distributed around the world. In addition to those, there are all the online boxes as well. Thank you for participating. What a great ministry this is. Coming up today, if you're watching on Sunday the 8th of November 2020, Then after our service, around about 11.45 a.m., then you can tune in for looking at the Go Deeper questions in your handout sheet, or you've got the option to come along physically to 26 Drysdale Avenue on Wednesday evening to look at those same questions. Please pray for our church leadership. Our church council has its monthly meeting tomorrow this coming Monday, Uh, and we'll be meeting by Zoom, so we're getting very high tech. Now, if it happens that we get more people come to our physical service than we can actually physically fit in the building, we have an overflow section with a large screen TV, even larger than this, and so we'll take turns in the overflow so that everyone gets a chance to be part of the physical service as well as the different experience of being part of an overflow. There's so much that we can pray about in this world. Uh, We can hardly begin to scratch the surface. But when God's people everywhere pray about what's going on in their little bit, then we cover the whole world together. So let's pray for one another and allow me to lead you in our little bit. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence, first of all, in worship, because you are beyond awesome, beyond anything we could know, beyond anything that our minds could comprehend. You have created more than we could even possibly discover in all our scientific endeavors. You are great beyond description. And you are also great in your love and your compassion and your grace and your mercy towards us. Thank you for all that you have done for us, given to us, planned for us to have and to be. Oh, now, Lord, give us the grace, the strength, the insight and the wisdom that we would deliberately daily choose to follow Jesus, to see his footprints ahead of us one step at a time and to choose to walk in his way. Oh, may we be strong enough, brave enough, courageous enough to step out of our little comfort zone, to follow you wherever you would call us, to become whatever you want us to be to achieve all that you have planned for us to be. But we'd also pray for others. There are people that we love who are wandering from the pathway. Lord, drag them back, draw them back, call them back, pull them back, uh, and use us to be part of your process too, so that we might walk together down this wonderful pathway towards a glorious destination. And they're walking through a broken world. And Father, we lift our world before you. Have mercy on us, we pray. As elections take place in key jurisdictions around the world, we pray for leaders returned and new. And we ask that you would give them the courage and the leadership 
to move in godly directions. Lord, save them from being drawn along by popular opinion or by political persuasion, but rather speak into their lives and grant that they would choose well so that we might live God lives of quietness and peace in godliness and holiness. So, Lord, we bring you our prayers. There is so much more that we could pray about, and you know our hearts. So take our prayers, for we offer them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Part of worship is giving, giving thanks, giving praise, giving worship. And we also have an opportunity to give physically. So for those of you who do contribute to our tithes and offerings and the love gifts that enable the gospel to flow through this church, thank you for your participation. And here are ways that you can share in that ministry. Here is a very important verse it's 1 Thessalonians 5:18 within every circumstance give thanks because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus now we're going to take that um, key verse and turn it into a beautiful song that Eleanor is going to lead us in my heart is filled with thankfulness Indeed, we have so much for which we can be thankful. We turn now to hear the word of the Lord. Subordinates, be in submission with all fear to rulers, not only to the good and fair, but also to the perverse. Because this is an act of grace, being conscious of God to endure any grief, suffering unjustly. How could it be to your credit if you are beaten for doing wrong and you endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, 
This is an act of grace before God. You have been called to this because, namely, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, out of that text, we're going to draw some thoughts. And please follow with me. You can take notes in your Go Deeper sheets if you printed those out. Follow the footprints in the sand. You're probably all familiar with this free verse. Picking up halfway through the, the third stanza, I noticed during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you the most, Lord, you would leave me. But he whispered, My precious child, I love you and will never leave you, never ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. And, and what a, a lovely, gracious thought that is. Now, it didn't begin back in the 1960s or 70s or whenever that was written. It goes back to about 1400 BC when the Lord said, In the wilderness you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached this place. And that place was the, the borders to step into the promised land. And now we have in our text today from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, Christ has given us example that we should follow in his footsteps. So here's the first of the three key things that we want to think about today. Follow Jesus' footprints through the world. Our opening verse tells us that we can walk with Jesus when the way is easy. Don't you love it when the people to whom you have to answer are good and fair? That does make the way easy. Jesus spoke about that. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, important thing is what he didn't say. He didn't necessarily say you'll find rest for your bodies. He didn't say that your circumstances will slow down and be easy. But within the busyness, there is a, a quiet place of rest for your soul. And that's great. But there's also the other side of that. We need to be walking with Jesus when the way is hard. Because not everyone is good and fair. Some people, and you probably know too many of them, who are also perverse. And they will just go out of your way to make life miserable. Jesus gets that. He was despised and rejected. He endured suffering and pain. He was someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. So if you are being harassed, then Jesus knows exactly what you are going through and, and he is there with you. And we find that here in this very next verse. He says, this is an act of grace, being conscious of God, even in the midst of the difficulties. So in taking notes, we walk with Jesus because the way is grace. Jumping elsewhere into the New Testament, we find the apostle who is facing a problem and repeatedly, repeatedly cries out to God, says, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Each time he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I gladly boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. It works a bit like this. Here you are, you're dragging this problem, you're struggling to get through and you're stuck with the problem. How do you handle that? Well, through prayer and that brings grace. Now notice that it does not make the problem go away. 
It does not make the problem any less, but it gives you the wherewithal to be able to continue on in spite of the problem. Because God says, my grace is all you need. My grace is all you need. So even as you struggle with the problems and the difficulties of life, and you have them, you face them every day, God's grace will carry you through. There's a second thing that we find in our text, and it's this. We follow Jesus' footprints, where? To the cross. Verse 20 says that you, now he's talking to Christians, to believers, to good people, you are beaten for doing wrong. You are not perfect. And so we walk with Jesus when life is fair. If you do something wrong, it is fair that you wear the consequences for wrongdoing. You're not perfect yet. You've got to wait till heaven before you get to that point. So let's think about the consequences of wrongdoing. Now, let's make it easy for starters. Let's begin with the other person makes a mistake. What do you do and not do when the other person is wrong? Well, first of all, don't yell, shout, make a big scene. And please don't go for blame and shame and hunting out whose fault is this? How can we get back at them? Now, just stop for a th- moment and think about if you make a big deal of any mistake next time the person makes a mistake and they will we all do next time they make a mistake what do you think they're going to do bring it to you or hide it from you when you when you make a problem bigger than it is or make a problem on top of a problem you only create another problem so don't go down that direction instead listen ask questions about what happened why did it happen how did it happen and then resolve the problem how do we fix the problem and how do we move forward out of this problem situation into a better place And then notice for you this last line. It's not about only what could the other person do to not have the same problem again, but what about you? How do you change so that you can be part of a bigger infrastructure that helps the problem not occur for that person or any other person or anywhere in your framework? That's the other person making a mistake pretty easy to deal with now what about if I'm the person who makes the mistake and I make plenty of them I know I'm not in heaven yet when I make a mistake don't hide it don't make excuses for it but at the other end of the scale don't let everyone know don't run around declaring how bad things are there are appropriate boundaries that we need to put in place. Some people will need to know and some people will not. Be discerning, don't do that. But do, do admit, do admit that you were the one who made the mistake. Take responsibility, be accountable and certainly apologize because it will have knock on effects that impact others. Ask yourself, what happened? Why did I go down this pathway? How did this happen? How did I get drawn into this? How did I make this mistake? And there will be consequences. And you might have to suffer serious consequences. Consequences exist. You can't get out of them. Accept it. And by admitting it and accepting responsibility, you're likely to mitigate those consequences. But then don't get stuck in this bad place of the result of something going wrong. Resolve to move out of it. Resolve the problem now and then go forward to a better place and reflect. I got it wrong. How could I do better in the future? 
and this has got nothing to do with anyone else. It's just how do I become a better person, a better self-manager? That's fair. What about when life is unfair? What about if you're doing good and you still end up suffering nonetheless? That is not fair. Well, once again, Jesus gets that. He knows about that because the cross was not fair. There is no good reason why Jesus should have to be the one to suffer. The cross was not fair. It gets worse. The gospel is not fair. It is not fair that Jesus gets my sin. It's not fair that I get his righteousness. It's not fair that Jesus takes the consequences and the punishment for everything that I have done wrong. And it's not fair that I get his free ticket into heaven. The gospel is not fair. In fact, the world is not a fair place since sin stepped in. But nevertheless, we walk with Jesus because the way is grace. If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is an act of grace before God. Remember, the gospel is not fair. It is by grace that you've been saved. Through faith, it's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Grace steps in when life is not fair. And then consider this. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, we often think the throne of grace and we're going to heaven. But consider this. Perhaps the throne of grace is where grace is given to us for salvation and we're just living out our salvation, which makes the throne of grace the cross of Calvary. Let us approach the cross again and again with confidence. Approach the cross because it's here at Calvary that we receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We never stop needing the cross and what Jesus has done for us on Calvary. And then there's one final thing that we can think about today. Now, last verse of the text. We follow Jesus' footprints wherever he leads. And he is the one who leads us on. We walk with Jesus when there seems to be no benefit for us. We walk with Jesus when only other people benefit. And it comes out of these words, Christ suffered for you. What was the benefit for Christ? Or was all the benefit for us? when he suffered for us. The gospel is not only unfair, the gospel is for the benefit of the one who is the recipient of righteousness in place of sin. We are the beneficiaries of the gospel. Uh, or these words, the father of compassion, yes, the God of all comfort, comforts us in all our troubles. Now, why are we in trouble and why are we drawing on God's comfort? The answer is in the next line. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received. Well, you see, the trouble that we went through and the comfort that we received was not just for us. It was so that we could pass on the benefit to someone else so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received. The focus is not on the trouble, but on the comfort that we're passing on. We have been blessed with God's comfort so that we can pass on that blessing of comfort to others. And it's come back to Jesus. Look at these last two lines. Just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ, our comfort overflows. 
others are benefiting through the comfort that we have received from Jesus. So when we're in trouble, where do we go? We go out of our trouble to the God of all comfort, the, the one who comforts us so that as we find the resources of grace that we need to go through the trouble, we have something that we can pass on to others. But it's not always easy. It's not easy. We are to walk with Jesus when there are no instructions for us to follow. Jesus left us an example, not a how-to manual. The Bible is not a how-to manual. It's a book that's full of examples. Some of it are examples of what to do. Lots of it is examples of what not to do. It's an example of how we should be walking, but it's not a book of instructions. Jesus, walking down the beach at the Sea of Galilee, says to the fishermen, Come, follow me. He didn't tell them where they were going, what they would be doing, what was involved. There were no details. And he didn't tell them that at the end of his journey there would be the cross. Nor did he tell them at the end of their journey there would almost certainly be, for most of them, a horrible death by martyrdom. He simply says, come, follow me, with no instructions. And then we follow Jesus when there's no explanation. We get to the point where there should have been, oh, it's all of grace and God's grace is going to be there for us. But it doesn't say that. There is no explanation. We walk down the beach and it seems like the waves wash away the footprints. Where are we going? What's going on? What's the explanation for what lies ahead of us or where we're going? Let's just stop for a moment and have a look at the big picture. This is our text for today. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 18 to 21 and it breaks into three natural segments. The first of them ends with half of that segment being about grace. It's an act of grace and it ex the, the verse it's a whole verse, an entire sentence devoted to talking about grace. When we move into the second segment, it's only a quarter of that segment. It's only one line. It's, it's only half a sentence that is talking about grace. We're supposed to get it. We're supposed to understand grace without it having to be spelled out in detail all the time, every time. As we're living by grace, we're incorporating it into ourselves. And then by the time we get down to the end of our text, where we would expect to find the words, this is an act of grace, as we've done in the earlier two segments, there's nothing spelt out. By now, we are supposed to have learned by what is not said. We're supposed to have incorporated grace into our lives and we're walking by the grace of God through every circumstance of life. Grace is not always visible. It's not always spoken. It's not always seen. But it is always there. Grace is always there. And sometimes we're called to walk down into a deep, dark valley of the shadow of death. But that's not the end of the journey. It's a pathway through to a better place. In his last meal with his disciples, hours before his arrest and crucifixion, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. He went on, you know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas, who could see only the waves washing away the footprints, said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we possibly know the way? And Jesus' answer was, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
you get to a place where you don't need the footprints. You don't need the details. You don't need everything spelled out step by step. There are no rituals. There is just the direction. And it's not about looking at the footprints, but about looking to the one who made the footprints. Looking to the one who is the way himself. And when you're finding Jesus, not footprints, but finding Jesus, then you found the way and you can make progress with your life. Don't lose sight of him. Follow him wherever he calls you. Let me pray for us. Father, the way is sometimes, very often in fact, difficult and it seems complex and indeed it is. It seems difficult and indeed it is. And all too often we see very little evidence of your footprints ahead of us and we don't know what we should choose or where we should go. Lord, lift up our eyes. So instead of looking down into the world to find your footprints, that we would look up and find that Jesus is just there in front of us, calling us and saying, come, follow me. Lord, give us the grace that we would follow in his name. Amen. We're copyright compliant. We have some interesting questions for you to think about, discuss over a cup of tea or over lunch. And I hope you get a chance to join us. Now, here's our final song, and it does tie in with what we've just been thinking about at the end of this message. Jesus is indeed love incarnate. With a prayer you fed the hungry, with a cry you still the storm, with a look you had compassion on the desperate and forlorn, with a touch you healed the leper, with a shout you Thank God that love 
and grace and mercy has come to us in Jesus. What makes our church so great? It's because we're following Jesus. Our very purpose is to make followers of Jesus by ourselves, being followers of Jesus. If you can be part of the Go Deeper discussion, you're most welcome. But wherever you go, keep on following Jesus. God bless you.